As you all know, the book I'm reading today is The Most Precious of Cargoes by Jean-Claude Grimberg. It was one of my anticipated releases for January and I could not resist buying it. So I thought I would give it the time of day and do a reading vlog. I was going to take this book for a nice long walk to the local park and then to the beach whilst reading along the way since it's a nice short book. However, it is snowing and as we know, books and snow are not friends. Snow and I, however, are great friends. We only see each other once a year, but when we do, we make sure we have some quality time together. So, I'm gonna go for a walk or two, I'm gonna keep sewing my 18th century men's shirt, and I'm going to read. This was filmed across a couple of days because I simply cannot get enough of walking in the snow. I also listened to Pet by Ikwake Mezi and In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, so I'll be talking about those as well. The Most Precious of Cargoes is a short book, but I found out it is even shorter, as the small pages have large writing and chapters are only a few pages long. It's about 100 pages, but I reckon I could have this easily read in about an hour and a half. This makes sense for the form, however, because this book is a fairy tale or, as it is intimidatingly called, a fable of the Holocaust. This wouldn't be my usual pick, but the premise of a Jewish father on a train deciding to throw one of his babies out into the forest in the hopes of giving it a chance to survive had me so intrigued I had to pick it up. This isn't a sob-worthily sad story. It doesn't give you the time to lament yourself to tears. As with other fairy tales, it is full of hardships and cruelty, but we are not forced to sit with them. However, it did give me that hot fizz in my nose, that sense of impending doom, rather early on. After a little reading, I decided to do some sewing. I've been taking my time these past few weeks in sewing an 18th century men's shirt. Yes. That is the poofy linen poet and or pirate shirt, which everyone secretly wants so they can live out one of a variety of fantasies. Right now, I'm gathering up the neckline to fit into the collar. These shirts are made exclusively from various rectangles and squares, intended not to waste a single scrap of fabric, so gathering is important to fit the shirt specifically to me. Caterpillar decided to join me and lounge on a towel that we have on the dining table. In this house, every now and again, a cat will just claim something, like a towel left momentarily on a dining table, and then it just becomes part of the furniture until you say, film yourself sewing and realize that you have a fur covered bath towel on the table that you call a dining table, yet never actually use as a dining table. Back to sewing. Whilst I was filming this, I kind of realized the value of film over still image. It's very hard to capture the beauty of this linen and my needle running through it in a still photograph, but put it on film and it comes alive. Maybe this is my first step in becoming an amateur filmmaker. Are YouTubers filmmakers? Some may say an emphatic no, but it cannot be doubted that YouTubers pick up a certain set of skills when it comes to making videos. The snow was definitely calling me, as it was clearly calling Caterpillar, but I was determined to get the collar looking somewhat like a collar before I left. Is this good enough? This is good enough. Audiobooks are an absolute blessing when it comes to getting outside. Not that I need an excuse to get out in the snow, but on dull, cold days without snow, audiobooks are fantastic encouragement. Today, I'm listening to Pet by Kweke Amezi. I've not read their work before, also yay for non-binary writers, but I definitely want to read more. I also haven't read any AYA since, well, since I was a young adult. Even then, I've only read a handful of young adult books, but I really enjoyed this book. It's about a girl called Jam, who happens to be trans, but that isn't a big deal in this world. Jam is growing up in a town called Lucille, which in the past had got rid of all of its monsters. These monsters being bad people, politicians, cops. But our protagonist accidentally brings about a new creature, 
one that appears monstrous, yet exists to hunt a monster. A monster in her best friend's house. I really appreciated that this book involved the parents. Yes, all children's stories need a departure from the parents in order for the children to have an adventure. But Jam's parents did not need to die some tragic death in order for her to start her story. They are, in fact, an integral part of the inciting incident. Also, Jam's mum is an artist, and it's clear that being an artist is a respected and proper career choice in this particularly utopian society of Lucille, which I appreciated. I think I found myself wanting some of the darker stuff to be explored further in this book, but I reminded myself that this is YA, and in this context the harder stuff in this book isn't shied away from, but is treated with a respectful distance. This book has boundaries, and I respect that. So this park has some nice, healthy rosemary bushes, of which I may have liberated of a few stems at some point last year, but right now, though it's still rather healthy looking, it is looking a little sad and probably shouldn't be used for anything more than a cheeky bit of aromatherapy. My favourite part of the park is a medieval herb garden, which is, well, empty at this time of year, aside for some rather famished looking sage, holiest of herbs and some even more famished lavender. The birds like this part of the park too. I'm back off home now to read the rest of The Most Precious of Cargoes. So this is Puck. Isn't he beautiful? He and Caterpillar are brothers. Puck isn't quite as rambunctious as Caterpillar, but he loves to play and purr very loudly. After staring out of the window with Puck for a while, and curling up with a hot water bottle, I got back to reading. In order for this to be a little different from a wrap-up, I decided to give you my genuine, instant impression of the book. So it won't be the most nuanced of reviews, but it will show my genuine emotional reaction to the book. So, my initial reaction to this book. I don't know, it was like kind of saddening, kind of jarring at the end. Um, I found out that uh, Jean-Claude Grimberg, his family were taken in the Holocaust. So he has a personal connection to this and he created this fable, um, which is, it's really like a fairy tale. It really is. I feel like this is the kind of book to be shared and discussed like a fairy tale as well. I couldn't actually tell where it was going to go, which was nice for something so simple in a way, so short and simple. So the writer's French and it does feel very French somehow, sort of probing and questioning of the truth and what stories are and what they're not um, in a very subtle way. It's not digging terribly deep but it sort of almost playfully questions these things and every now and again the narrator's voice will just step in for a moment. Even if it's just to, to remark on something, there was a uh, talk of someone making wood-based alcohol um, which I have a feeling is where absinthe comes from. The narrator says, oh, well, I could tell you the recipe, but I won't, and I don't know it anyway, uh, but it can turn you blind. And it's just like these little like asides that almost feels um, a bit like Dickens in a way. And Dickens has a very, very much a quality of telling you a story, sitting you down and telling you a story. And I think this every now and again gives a little bit of that feeling 
the narrator steps in just for a sentence and just gives you that little bit of connection um, with him personally, I guess. And Frank Wynne has a little comment in the back. Frank Wynne is the translator um, who says like he hopes he has captured the voice and I think he has uh, he's achieved that. It's got a very specific kind of voice. This quite a patronly um, sat by a fire kind of voice. Quite grandfatherly. Oh and yes the uh, the child actually does get thrown out of a train window. <laughs> um, like, like literally thrown out of a train window but it is thrown into snow so you know there was some care taken but still um, <laughs> this kind of peculiar happening only really can happen in a in a story you would not throw a month old baby out of a window into snow I kind of want to go back to this one again and see how it matures um, with a second read maybe but now I kind of want something a little meatier to get into a little a little more stodgy uh, for my my appetite small interruption the next day, I decided to go for a walk, which turned out to be a long walk while listening to In the Dreamhouse by Carmen Maria Machado. Whilst this book isn't necessarily dense, it is definitely a bit heavier and provided a nice change of pace to Pet and the Most Precious of Cargoes. In the Dreamhouse is a fragmented memoir of Carmen Maria Machado's past abusive lesbian relationship. It is presented as a long string of vignettes exploring different forms while slowly building a narrative. For example, Dreamhouse is lesbian pulp fiction. Dreamhouse is choose your own adventure. Dreamhouse as confession. This and Machado's use of second person, which, when it is rarely used, is often jarring, but works in this book. The fragmented style and the use of second person creates the feeling of dissociation that often comes hand in hand with abuse and trauma. Machado speaks back to herself, you. She emulates the excitement of the start of the relationship using what the zeitgeist has to offer on lesbian fantasies. She looks at how we use these narratives outside of ourselves to make sense of our lives, even in the darkest of times. I don't know if it was the lovely walk or the coconut hot chocolate I bought, or the rich images and reflections Machado conjured, but I found myself being deeply reflective, being reminded of memories I haven't thought of in years, like my friend's brother who used to send me declarations of love when I was a kid, and the declarations I returned, despite us both turning out pretty queer in the end. Was it performance? Was it us recognising something of ourselves in the other and mistaking it for love? or love being encouraged by adults? Who knows, but it was quite an entertaining memory to have whilst reading quite a queer book. Back to the most precious of cargoes. I'm just mulling it over in my head. Um, I do feel like this is a book to be shared though. I almost feel like I want to, to like sit down and like read it with someone uh, if they would let me. <laughs> Uh, I don't think, hey, do you want to read this fairy tale that's set during the Holocaust is like everyone's most, <laughs> is everyone's idea of entertainment. But um, yeah, I think it's something to be shared and discussed. I did find the end jarring there. It's, it's, it, I felt like it didn't let me sit with the emotions of the story. But I almost feel like it that's the point of it. It doesn't want you to it doesn't want you to be so swept up in the story part of this, the small world part of this, that you forget the the grander scale and what created the situation that fueled the plot. Um because obviously the context is important. I really don't read um, wartime stuff very much, um, mainly because I don't like the idea of war being 
glorified, um, even if it is being condemned in the same breath. Yeah, this was a refreshing um, take, I guess, on a war story. There's a moment of connection between the woodcutter and the baby. And oh, it just really gets you um, because it's so hard to overcome your own prejudices. And I think it just shows that moment so well um, because we're, we're all afraid when, we're, when our prejudices are revealed um, and we don't want to change them. You know, it, it's this identity struggle between, you know, what we are and realising that what we are is not what we want to be. You know, we all think of ourselves as good, open people. Um, we all think of ourselves as kind of righteous in some capacity. And to have that suddenly dawn on you that you are not amongst <laughs> the righteous in that sense um it can really just change how you see everything um and really be life-changing and also really really scary at the same time and i think it just so simply and beautifully pins down that moment emotionally um yeah i think that bit had my had my little heartstrings being tugged and I think Grimberg has achieved what he wanted to do. Yeah, he is, he's mixed me up inside and made me sit and think. I hope you enjoyed this vlog as well. I wanted to just create something quite calming um, and wintry and just talk. Um, yeah, tell me if you'd like this and if you'd like any more of this. Um, I love to get trying in the comments, so please tell me what you think and uh, yeah, I will see you next week with uh, my March anticipated reads and following that wrap up, which I'll talk probably a little bit more about this and obviously about Pet and Triggy Bane and much, much more. So I will see you then. <laughs>